So this talk is on the efforts to prepare VLBI for the next decade. My co-authors are Marta Bautista and Jose Antonio Lopez Perez from the Instituto Geográfico Nacional de Spain. Um, I am Hajo Hase from BKG Germany. The current situation of geodetic VLBI, you can see on the left uh, map, we have several LIGO stations, some are in operation, others are in the planning stage, stage and some others are in between. The IVS is operating the network of global uh, VLBI stations. And in Vigos, we observe the frequency range 2 to 14 gigahertz with 32 channels of 32 megahertz bandwidth each. In other words, uh, we cover a bandwidth of one gigahertz out of the range of 2 to 14 gigahertz. The same spectrum is targeted by telecommunications on ground and in space. And uh, our Vigos broadband receivers, which had been developed to improve Vigos, they catch all signals from cosmic. These are the desired uh, radiations, but also from man-made origin. And the latter one is our increasing problem. Problem number one, we see that massive satellite constellations will reach in about 2030, in the year 2030, the number of more than 100,000 orbiting transmitters. That corresponds to one sender in each square degree section of the sky. And satellite downlinks are done in the range of 10.7 to 12.7 gigahertz. So the responsibility of national authorities is clear related on ground-based transmitters. But in which altitude finishes the sovereignty? So the International Telecommunication Union can regulate, but basically, um, the commercial use of space is widely unregulated. Radio telescopes will receive much more unwanted emissions if there is no regulation for protection. And you see in the bottom of this uh, slide uh, the situation for a specific date. It was May last year in Wetzel, and you see a number of satellites already being in the sky above that cell Hello. where we try to do yes uh, can you please make it in a full screen mode because it's oh, very I small on i forgot that thanks okay thank you so uh yeah so you see there uh, at the bottom the situation full of satellites or transmitters as we see it <laughs> uh covering the sky and this will fill up fill up in the years to come <laughs> the problem number two is the expansion of international mobile telecommunication imt um, on this plot or let's say the the invention of the cell phone wi-fi uh, wide area, local area networks and other communication services demand more and more bandwidth. In the middle of this uh, slide, you see uh, what the radio regulation contains. Each color or each block you see there is dedicated to one service of the ITU. So this is one IMT is one service among 40 others. And as you can see, uh, the frequency range from 2 to 14 gigahertz is already filled up with all kinds of uh, services. And uh, most of the frequencies are shared by more than one service. 
on, on the bottom, you see these red lines. These are our channels, which we used in the Vigos 00 setup or the benchmark configuration. We have there our 32 channels divided in four bands. We call them A, B, C, D. And each of the band contain eight channels of 32 megahertz bandwidth. And uh, for technical limitations, the first tests were done in the range between three and 10.7 gigahertz. This is not the perfect or the best performing um, configuration. On the uh, above, uh, we marked in blue color uh, a better configuration, which we call, which I call the Vigos performance, where we spread between the lowest and the highest frequencies. Uh, we, we have a wider span bandwidth, and this is important in order to increase the resolution and the precision of our measurements. And as you can see, uh, as well, I should explain <laughs> above. The, on, on top, you see green and yellow bars. Uh, these are frequencies which are chased or requested by services. And the green one were negotiated on the World Radio Conference 2023, let's say last year. And the yellow bars are in the upcoming World Radio Conference cycle in 2027 to be allocated. And as you can see, uh, we, with our band C in red, we tried to go uh, away and uh, use the band uh, between 7 and 8.5 gigahertz in blue. But this is now also under under a discussion to be given to international mobile telecommunication. So this will be also uh, maybe uh, no way in a couple of years that we use that frequency. So there's a problem of going away while the commercial uh, communication networks are expanded. And in in, in summary, it means that the unwanted emissions for geodetic VLVI will increase. So how, how act the unwanted electromagnetic emission to our VLVI measurements? We can express it by the uncertainty of our delay tau uh, with the given formula above. There are two parameters in uh, which are important for us and which we can uh, handle. The RMS, the root mean square of the spanned bandwidth, that is lowest to highest frequency as seen before, is one parameter. And uh, well, the, the number for the mode zero, zero, the red bars from the previous slide is 2.93. So it's it's a number normal. And then the signal to noise ratio, which is achieved by the integration time or the scan length of observation. Um, this can is a variable parameter. And as you can see, um, for different SNR, we can approach the millimeter. This is what you want to have with a GIGOS requirement. You want 3.3 picoseconds and only with the SNR of about 40, we can reach that. While the sources are faint, uh, some sources need more integration times than others. However, if the system noise, so the noise coming out of the electronics of the telescope of the instrument is even uh, more, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, how do you say? <laughs> if the noise is increasing, increased by additional noise coming from all these transmitters orbiting or from the ground, uh, then of course the the SNR drops. And to give you a quantitative uh, 
measure for that. So if the noise level increased by 50%, then the SNR drops already by 18%. And you see in the blue numbers how we go away from the 3.3 picoseconds or from the millimeter. So this noise is critical uh, in order to reach with the VIGOS system, which was meant to meet the GIGOS goals. But we cannot go indefinitely away from additional noise when you know a little bit about the receiver technology. So how much man-made can be can man-made noise can be tolerated? Telecommunication engineers they know that the amplifiers have a linear range in which they can amplify the signals. This is the range we would like to use and have available for our geodetic VLBI measurements. But then there's a threshold where the receiver or the amplifier can't amplify anymore, and this is the compression point, PI1 dB. And this determines where more power entering the amplifier cannot be amplified with the same power anymore. And uh, there is a distinction between two uh, levels which, <laughs> which are critical for the receiver. One is that you can even destroy amplifiers if the signal is too strong. This has happened if, for example, a radar, nearby radar, uh, has damaged a VLBI receiver, for example, a ship radar uh, close to the New Allison station. But it can also happen if we have the um, the radar missions of the synthetic Apache radars, which are flown uh, around um, the, the Earth, and they are also now commercial uh, commercial missions. Uh, with the capacity to destroy our receivers. So um, the, the other thing you can learn when the sketch is that when we are in the linear range operating, each additional noise uh, decreases the headroom in order to amplify. And so that means that our cosmic radiation bits in the bitstream for the correlator uh, they become less and less, and this uh, limits the SNR. Take note also about the sensitivity. Uh, the output power of a usual uh, cell phone is 0 0.2 watts, while our destructive uh, level is 2 million times stronger or less. So we are very, very sensitive. And of course, uh, whatever man-made signal is stronger. The question is how we can mitigate uh, to be affected of the unwanted electromagnetic uh, emission. So one can work around, find new frequency spectrum where there are no senders close to our radio telescope sites. But over the time, this gaps will be gone anyhow. Um, the second uh, possibility to mitigate is to use new feeds or develop new feeds where you exclude uh, certain frequency ranges, for example, starting at 3 gigahertz and not at 2 anymore, because below 3 gigahertz, everything is so dense populated that we have only noise in, the, in our uh, VLBI antennas. But this, uh, the filter characteristic of the feed uh, can only address the lowest and the highest frequency and uh, in between the signals we will also catch. Third, we can implement superconducting filters, um, but this is also limited because um, the overall sensitivity of the receivers is then also limited by each filter which is put in. Digital filtering at the back end um, does not protect against overloading at the front end. So there's also not really uh, a help from there. The fifth is 
to use VLBI only or declare radio quiet zones or coordination zones. This is fine. This can be granted by national spectrum authorities, but we are not immune against radiation from satellites. The sixth point is uh, that we can communicate our observation schedules to satellite operators. Recently, there have been some demonstrations between Starlink and US radio astronomy facilities, and this has worked out. So this might be an option, but there is, of course, no obligation for all services or all space operators to follow us in order to know where our telescopes are pointing to and then switch off the the broadcast. And the seventh uh, point may be it's also work around adapt the observation schedule, for example, to avoid low elevations where you find a lot of ground noise. However, uh, if we observe long baselines, uh, for example, between South America and Europe, then we need the low elevation in order to have the visibility to the same quasar. And so if we exclude low elevations, um, we, we eliminate, eliminate basically uh, long baselines, very long baselines, and uh, also the atmospheric sample sampling will be critical. So in summary, all approaches to mitigation with technology or, or intelligence lead to a decrease of performance of geodetic VLBI. And this raises the question, whether we have a sort of admin, admin. Uh, if, uh, if you will, could you please uh, speed this up? We have like two, three minutes left or so. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the, the way out of it is uh, administrative sp um, mitigation. And this is then done by the ITU. But you have to keep in mind that the regulation of spectrum uh, is only well, the, the authority are the national institutes and the ITU level regulates frequency use within international treaties. Uh, a spectrum administrator sees a spectrum like this, as you have seen before, and there is no space where geodetic VLBI is recognized, so we cannot defend our activity unless we enter to the regulations, to the radio regulations. And and this is the administrative uh, process. As you see in the in the green bar, uh, there are only very few um, bands allocated to radio astronomy service and geodetic VLBI as receiving uh, cosmic radiation is seen as uh, radio astronomy service. So the radio astronomy service at the ITU level is treated in study group seven, and there's a working party 7D, especially for radio astronomy service. And in this group, we try to manage to get protection in the future for geodetic VLBI. So our goal is that we can achieve an agenda item in the World Radio Conference 20, 31. And for that, we need the support of more than one national spectrum administration. And we would like to challenge to give protection for fixed frequencies, which has to be fined still by the IVS. So we need to know, we need to communicate the channels. And uh, the this is only possible to get an agenda item if in the World Radio Conference 2027, which is ahead of us, a number of national space uh, national spectrum administrations are proposing such an agenda item. And for that, we have already done uh, some work. So we started to have a, request, a question on geodetic VLBI to the ITU, and it was answered by a technical report in 2022. And actually, we're expecting for the next year to have an ITU recommendation on geodetic VLBI, uh, which is 
than at least known in the vocabulary of the ITU. So my last slides uh, summarize uh, what is on our to-do list in order to rescue VLBI and assure that in 2030 and, and, uh, and further, we still can operate and have access to our quasars. So the IVS has to fix the frequencies. Um, the Vigo stations have to maintain good relations to the national spectrum authorities, and we need to win them in order to set up a joint group in order to propose the agenda item. This is a huge task for us, as we are always normally concentrated to make geodetic duties, either in analysis or in working at the stations. And so this is sort of political work, and uh, it should be done uh, <laughs> in a mo more efficient way. Well, and then if uh, the agenda item is accepted, the study cycle between 27 and 31 will study how our demand is impacting the other services. Yeah, so this is what I wanted to broadcast to you. Um, and if there are questions, I'm happy to receive them. Thank you very much.